So here is a type 1A supernova light curve from um, the actual event as it uh, dims over time. And just by looking through it at different filters, you can see that there is a distinct difference in the shape of the light curve when you, when you look at different filters and, and different kinds of light. It also looks very different if you're looking at it in x-ray or out optical or ultraviolet. Uh, here, for instance, here's a typical 1A light curve. Here's a typical 2. Now, here and this, this one up here, this uh, enormous light curve from 2006 GY was also um, a hypergiant, hypermassive star, and that's probably, that's what Eta Carina is going to look like when it does go. It's going to produce incredible amounts of energy. Um, this says here, this is a typical type, type 2 light curve, but we've already seen that there are three different kinds, um, and the only one we've actually seen from start to finish was 1987A, and it doesn't match any of the three sort of generalized light curves that I've shown you so far just goes to show you we really still do not know what typical is. This is SS Cygni, which is a dwarf nova. Uh, it is a very close binary system. We have a very low mass, like 0.4 mass uh, main sequence star with a 0.6 mass white dwarf. Um, and it has a, a six and a half hour orbit. That's how close together they are. So there's a lot of material from the star accreting and, and, and ending up on the surface of the white dwarf, but what makes a dwarf nova different than a regular nova is that it isn't hydrogen fusion, um, uh, hydrogen fusion because of accreting hydrogen on this, on, on, that's dropping onto the surface of the white dwarf. The disk itself that's with the accretion material in it that's circling the white dwarf reaches some critical temperature when it reaches some critical temperature, the viscosity of the disk changes, and the material within the disk just whoomp, falls onto the surface of the white dwarf. It just collapses onto the surface and produces this thermonuclear event. And uh, SS Cygni in the AAVSO uh, database of uh, variable stars of the season has a lot of information about uh, SS Cygni. It has been continuously observed since 1911. Uh, we, our recurrent nova is T. Uh, Pixidus, a cat cataclysmic variable, as seen from the ground and as seen from Hubble. And what this one's kind of interesting, it took a while to figure out what kind of a nova this was, so they made its own class called recurrent nova. It's not a nova, it's not a dwarf nova. Um, and what, what makes this one different is, number one, there's only a handful of these. I think there's around seven or eight so far that's been discovered. Um, what makes them so different is that not only do you have the nova event where the white dwarf, you know, undergoes this little thermonuclear event on its surface, but it also ejects debris. And it ejects the debris, but the debris doesn't move away from the system. It's kind of trapped in this disk of all of this debris that's been thrown off from every time it, it goes nova, it produces all this debris field, and it's confined within a disk. So maybe the companion star is acting uh, w with enough forces around this white dwarf to keep all of this ejected material right there in that vicinity. Now, SS Cygni and T. Pixidus are low mass main sequence stars. So they would be plotted around in here, you know, somewhere in here on the HR diagram. And this is the light curve that they produce. This is um, SS Cygni. This is T. Pixidus. Um, and, but remember that those light curves are being produced by material dropping onto the surface of a white dwarf, and those white dwarfs are actually located down here on the HR diagram. So, we have all of these light curves, which, as we said, is a plot of change in brightness over time. Uh, and you can see that they are all very distinct from each other, very different. If some of them might look like they're similar, if you counted the number of days or the period, they'd be very different. Some of them take hundreds or thousands of days. Some of them take less than a day. But when you see something specific like R. Lyrae 
or recurrent nova or myra, uh, you know the kind of star you have. If you plot this change in brightness over time and you come up with these curves, it tells you a lot about the behavior of the star and what's going on. Now, most of the light curves you see will have Ju JD or Julian Day on them. I see that they are starting to change that somewhat. I'm starting to see light curves with days, weeks, years uh, as time instead of Julian Day. Uh, Julian Day is simply the number of days that has passed since January 1st, 4713 BC. Um, at noontime today, uh, we achieved Julian Day 2,456,542. And because it starts at noontime, universe, uh, universal time, this is the fraction of time that has passed uh, since uh, noontime. That's at 1 o'clock. So we have Julian Day. But on a lot of these light curves, you're going to see phase instead of Julian Day or any specific amount of time. Now, there is no way that you can designate observe, enough observing time on any mission to just look at a, char, a star that's variable and changing in its brightness over time. There's too much science to do with missions to designate, and, and, and there are at least 50,000 variable stars that we know of. So fortunately, we have the AAVSO in particular, uh, has a, a network of more than 500 variable star observers around the world. They have contributed more than 24 million uh, observa individual observations to the AAVSO database. So if you, for instance, here is uh, a Cepheid light curve at SIG, and you can see that, okay, you have a bunch of of data here from like maybe one observer or two or three observers, but it's not enough to determine the period. Until you determine the period, you don't know what kind of variability you're looking at. So what they do is for every one of those up and downs, you know, if you printed it all out on a long piece of transparency and then cut the curve in the same place every time and stack them all up on top of each other, you would be superimposing all of those cycles on top of each other, and you would have something that looked like this. So you see, now that you've got all of these individual cycles all stacked up, you, it, it defines the cycle better. You can see that it's going to rise to maximum here, it's going to go down to minimum here. It gives you a better idea. So now this is called the phase. This is the beginning of the phase or the cycle halfway through in one full cycle from maximum to minimum. But if you look at it, you still can't really determine the period very well because you, you need two really good minima or two really good maxima or some point in between but the same spot to determine what that cycle is. So what they do is take this information here and plot it twice. So here is 0 to 1 down here. There's that same data down here, 0 to 1. And that same data has been plotted in front of it and that's minus one to zero. And you can see it's the same exact data. So we're almost there. They want the maximum to begin at the origin. So then all they do is just slide it all over. They determine where the maximum is. They slide it over so the maximum is right on the origin at negative one phase. And now you can determine the period with some degree of accuracy. So you can use it any way you want to. Um, you might want to use the period luminosity relationship to determine the distance to that variable star. Um, the, and so the, 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 the whole power in science is prediction. So how do you know if you've determined everything correctly, the period and the beginning of the cycle, the maximum, which is called the epoch? Well, you have O minus C uh, diagrams the uh, observed minus calculated. So you have the phase now on the side, and then you uh, plot what your observations and compare them to what you, th what you had determined was the period and the epoch. Anything that's a straight line is perfectly periodic. Uh, if it's not a straight line, it's not periodic. If it is centered on zero, then you have the correct epoch, you have the correct beginning of the cycle. And if you, you can have all of these other things uh, that are different. We have perfectly periodic down here. Uh, the epoch changed, though. The period didn't change, but now it's periodic, 
but at a different starting point. This one is changing its period every day. It's not periodic whatsoever. Uh, this one is perfectly periodic. Uh, the epoch is right, it's centered on zero, but the, the period is now shortening and now it's lengthening, so it's changing its behavior over time. So the O minus C diagrams are used to determine uh, if, you, if your star is changing in its variability, in its behavior. And the slope of the line is a difference between its period and its estimated period. Now here are some of these misleading diagrams. This one actually says new nova and supernovae here. But you cannot plot supernovae on an HR diagram. It's a plot of temperature versus absolute magnitude. A supernova uh, has all kinds of different temperatures depending upon what part of the remnant. There are bright, highly energetic knots. There's, there's the thermal stuff in the background. There's the stellar core. I mean, where would you choose your temperature to be? So you, have, you cannot have an extended source plotted on an HR diagram. So that's absolutely incorrect. Over here it says semi-regular variables, and then it says long period variables. Well, that should say Myra variables, because both Myras and semi-regulars are long period variable stars. Uh, same thing here, it says long period, it says red semi-regulars. No, they don't even mention Myra. And red semi-regulars are also long period variables. And over here they've simply called this whole thing long period variables, but they've made no distinction. I mean, here's Myra, they, they do have in here, which is a Myra variable, but up here is Betelgeuse, which is a semi-regular variable, which is also a long period variable. So, pay attention to these HR diagrams that you come across and try to stay away, don't get confused or misled by them because they are misleading and incorrect. Uh, we have uh, an X-ray binary, uh, GRS1915 plus 105, and this one is producing a light curve that is an X-ray heartbeat, kind of similar to a Cepheid variable doing its optical heartbeat. 